started. Um, today we're going to do a training on the National Institute of Health Biosketch for Patient Research Advocates. Um, and so we have wonderful presenters here today. I'm just going to go ahead and kind of read through their bios just so you guys are familiar with who we have here today. Um, so our first presenter is Michelle Longabaugh. And Michelle's a wife, she's a mother of three grown children, an author, and a registered nurse working in cardiac rhythm management in Wichita, Kansas. So she's on Zoom World here from Wichita. Um, she's a, she works as a field cl clinical support for pacemakers and defibrillators for Biotronic Incorporated. She was diagnosed with stage four anal cancer in February of 2010. Michelle works and volunteers in the area of cancer survivorship, awareness, and advocacy for rare and stigmatized cancers. Um, Michelle has been a member of Pivot since 2016 and serves on our patient leader team as well as co-chairs the Education Task Force. And then next we have Peggy Johnson. So Peggy is a 29-year um, cancer and um, access to care advocate and a six-year breast cancer survivor. She is also the Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Wichita Medical Research and Education Foundation. She currently serves as the co-chair of the Kansas Cancer Partnership through the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And Ms. Johnson is a longtime volunteer with Susan G. Komen for the local Kansas affiliate and for the national Komen efforts. She is also the chair of the Midwest Cancer Alliance Community Advisory Board. Uh, Peggy has also been a member of Pivot since 2016 and serves on our patient leader team and then co-chairs the Education Task Force with Michelle. Our next presenter is Wendy Kogan. Wendy is a rare disease survivor with multiple rare mutations including hemophilia A and hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or HEDS and a, she also has a rare cancer mutation. As a patient with EDS and a sufferer of multi-system Systemic impacts of HEDS, Wendy's personal goal is to advance awareness, medical education, and research for EDS by leveraging her experiences as an RN and a business executive at Sprint. Um, after she was diagnosed at age 57, Wendy engaged in patient advocacy to help pave the way for others to obtain earlier diagnosis and to care. In addition, Wendy functions as a research patient advocate by assisting with EDS research proposals. Uh, Wendy is a cancer previvor who carries a rare breast cancer mutation that resulted in her mother passing from metastatic breast cancer. Wendy is a member of Pivot and she also serves on our education task force team. Um, and then we have Susan Harp and she's here in person. She's the assistant director for the grant development and research resources for the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Susan has been employed with, by KUMC for 18 years and has been assisting with grant and proposal development for over 23 years. She, along with her colleague, um, Anka Gianna, did I say her last name? Gianna. Gianna, yeah. helped Cancer Center researchers prepare over 100 applications annually focusing on proposals from the NCI, NIH, DOD, Susan G. Komen, American Cancer Society, CDC, and numerous cancer foundations. So that's a great description of all our presenters. So we'll go ahead and get started. All right. I'm ready. Okay. These are just the objectives of what we're doing today. Um, we're going to learn who needs to have a biosketch, understand the role of a patient advocate's biosketch, and understand when to use it, and then at the end, learn how to create one. Next slide. What is a biosketch? So for a biosketch in general is used to highlight an individual's qualifications for a specific role in a proposed project. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the coming slides, um, but it is to be not to not mention that the NIH requires a biosketch for senior key persons applying for or renewing NIH grants. A lot of times when you go out to the NIH site and you're like, oh, give me help writing my bio sketch. It's geared toward someone who is applying for a grant. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at it in another light tonight of how the bio sketch is actually used, like when a researcher is looking for someone to partner with them or, or help them with some research. Um, so we can go to the next slide. No, don't go to the next slide. I'm not ready, go back. I didn't say everything I wanted to say. Okay. <laughs> So 
Well, I'm supposed to give a couple examples, and I have a note here to say that, and I just was moving along. So for me, the biosketch is when you want to participate as the patient voice for a research trial, that is a large gamut of things. So a couple of examples of that might be from being part of a think tank, which would be like a specialized program of research excellence, would be like a SPORE committee where they're just trying to think up ideas of what, what could we maybe do to actual trial design or to helping somebody who's trying to write something to give them advice, to help a researcher get advice from a person who's actually had the lived experience. They can also be used in applying for participation in advocacy events. So if you're very interested in public policy, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, if you're very interested in doing those kind of things, that's where your biosketch comes in handy. If you want to speak at the state or national to the government, you want to be a, at a at a government day where we're speaking to our legislature about a certain uh, cancer policy, the biosketch is very handy for that as well. So now you can go to the next slide. So um, this is Peggy. Welcome, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about who really needs a biosketch. So um, Michelle's given some really good examples of how you could use your biosketch. So really, a biosketch is for any advocate who desires to become a public voice, um, not only for research development, but also for grant review and to serve on re a research team as an advocate. So, um, it, and Michelle gave really, really good examples of that. Um, very often, KU might get a request for someone to serve on a grant. Um, many grants now encourage, some actually require to have a patient advocate as part of the research team. And the really good thing is that K they could go to KU and they could say, we're looking for a patient advocate who knows something about anal cancer and they would immediately so KU would start looking through their files and they would come up with Michelle Longabaugh and they could share with Michelle's approval they could share her bio sketch with the researcher um, and very often as she talked you could use it in a public policy um, um, atmosphere you could also use it um, I think it's always interesting when people want to know about a, a patient advocate. So I've been a patient advocate for a long time, but I've only had a bio sketch for about 10 years. And it's always interesting to get the feedback that, oh, you're a volunteer, but you have a bio sketch. And I think it adds a professionalism to being a volunteer so that they know that you're very serious about being a patient advocate, being a voice. So they're not hard to do, but you can use them in all sorts of ways. Um, KU could also use them that if they had a request for one to, someone to serve on a national committee, um, they could then get your bio sketch and they could submit your name to represent KU and the patient's voice on a national committee. And using your bio sketch, they would be able to look at what your background is, and what you're going to bring to the table. Next slide, please. So the role of the bio sketch, researchers actually are going to look at your story and we're going to show you a bio sketch so that you can see what this looks like. But the first thing they look at is your personal statement. And that personal statement is why you have decided to become a patient advocate. I was a patient advocate a long time before I was a breast cancer survivor. So I really had to explain in my personal statement why it was important to me to have the patient's voice in research, in public policy, at the na national level when they're looking at funding. Um, and I believed that my voice was, was valuable. Those are things that you're gonna put in your personal statement. Uh, Wendy's going to give us a great example of what's in her personal statement, 
And it's, it's because of the back, Wendy's background. So the personal statement is very, very important. Um, you're going to list your interests. So your interests could be um, whatever you do in your professional life, um, other volunteer acti activities. Um, you're going to talk about your experience. So these are going to be histories, um, your history of things that you've done, um, committees that you've, that you've sat on. Um, Michelle has written several articles and written a book. Those are going to be part of what she puts in her experience. And you're also going to put any prior activities. And those are going to be things that you're going to be able to build through your experience with Pivot. And you're going to put your, your work background. So it's going to be your work and your volunteer experience. And it's going to be any volunteer experience that you think um, relates to the position that you're actually looking at. Next slide, please. So what's the role of the biosketch when a grant, um, a grantee is looking at it, a grant, someone reviewing a grant. And when I review grants, one of the very first things I do is I look at somebody's personal statement. Their personal statement says to me how committed they are to their research. I look at a personal statement for researchers I also look at the personal statement for the patient advocates and the consumer reviewers. I want to know what their personal statement, what their personal commitment is to the research that they're actually doing. Then um, grant reviewers will look at the education and training. And education is one thing, but training is another. So right now you're getting training on how to write a biosketch. So one of the things that you would put on your um, biosketch would be that you've done a webinar on NIH biosketches. Um, you're going to put any kind of uh, experience that you have. And don't worry, if you haven't had a lot, you will pretty soon. And these are things that you're going to build on in your biosketch um, each year. Um, Sarah's doing a great job of she's going to give us a tool where we're going to be able to catalog those things that we do through KU and anywhere else so that you can go back and look at, at your particular catalog and see those things that you participated in. And the last thing that they're gonna look at is what have been your contributions, either to advocacy or when it's a researcher to science. Sometimes as an advocate, you may even be able to participate and add to science because you're gonna be able to work with those researchers and be able to let them know what the patient's voice is um, in, in their research. Next slide, please. Sarah, can we yeah. push the, can we, next slide, please. I did, can you not see it? It's now when to use a biosketch. Oh. And that's not me. Oh, it must be me. Here I am. Here I am. It's okay. I, I, that's hilarious. Because when she's the next slide, I'm like, I'm just listening. I'm participating. It's okay. Oh, yeah. I'm participating. So let's not forget who's, who's telling you what to do. Hmm. If you are applying for any research, when are you going to use your bio sketch? So Peggy kind of already reviewed this. If you're applying for any research advocacy opportunity, um, leadership roles on committees, or grant review, if you're interested in, um, if someone's interested in you looking at a grant that they have from the patient perspective. If you are applying to represent the patient voice for public policy, research committees, or public forums, um, actually, the when we get to the example, which is on the next slide, not yet, but when we get there, you're actually going to see one of my bio sketches that's geared toward um, being on an NIH committee, which was the last thing that my most recent thing that I've done. But I also have a different personal statement that I've used because I have been in part of the public policy, sitting in public forums, testifying before the Senate in Kansas. I've done some of those things to make policy change, and my bio sketch looked different for that. But I left it. I left it as my most recent one, and 
And as you'll see, it's not 100% perfect, but it's a living document. And I, can't re I cannot emphasize that enough. You can't make a mistake on here, really. It's just, you're just going to be continually improving it. The way you say something or the experience that you put down or, um, you know, for me, I have, I have a live link on there to my blog and I guess that's a no-no according to Susan. I'm so sorry. You know, the NIH never <laughs> called me on that. I didn't, get, I didn't get in trouble, but you'll see it's highlighted in blue and it should not be. So I've actually already fixed the one that I have on my desktop at home, so it doesn't do that anymore. Um, but anyway, um, that's those are just a couple of different times where your biosketch is really handy to be used, not just for research, but if you are going to be a patient voice in other forums as well. Next slide. Um, creating your biosketch. Peggy, I think this might be you. Is it? Yeah, this is you, Peggy. We oh, can't hear you. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Um, so when you're creating your biosketch, the thing about the NIH biosketch is it's right there in front of you. It tells you what you need to be putting on there. Um, they've done a wonderful job of laying it out so that you just, it's like any form. You're gonna fill in the form. So it's gonna be your name, your position, it's going to be your education and your training. Um, and I, I think people, I think advocates get a little concerned about what their education and training will be. People are going to look at you. Um, they're, they're going to want to see your education and training. But the other things that you put on your NIH biosketch are the things that really are going to be very important to whoever's looking at it because they're going to be looking at it as a patient advocate or a consumer reviewer. So like we said before, you want to make sure that you're going to put in your personal statement. Everybody's just going to be different. Michelle actually talked about that she has more than one NIH biosketch. I do too. Um, because I've been asked to do a several different things, I tailor my biosketch to the thing that I'm actually either applying for or I'm being selected for. Um, not too long ago, I was asked to apply to be a DOD reviewer of breast cancer research applications. So I went back, looked at my sketch, and actually tailor, tailored my personal statement to how important um, cancer funding is to me. Um, that's, I think that's one of the things that they would be looking at I've also done a lot of um, work in Washington, D.C. on making sure that the cancer research funding stays in place. And so those were the things that I added to the particular sketch that I was doing for the DOD um, uh, reviewer. Uh, you want to be sure and put your positions in your honors. So that's going to be any of those committees that you've been on. Honors, you know, some of us have them. Some of us don't. Some of, some of us have lots. Um, if it's something you're comfortable put, putting on your bio sketch, I would encourage you to uh, include it. Not everybody's comfortable with including the, the honors or um, the things that they've been called out and, and uh, shown appreciated for what they've done. So that's going to be a personal decision on your, on your part. Contributions to science, like I said before, we're not going to have as many. Advocates aren't going to have as many. But some of you are going to have a lot. Broderick's done a lot. And Broderick's contribution to science, um, his is going to be pr fairly detailed because he's sat on a lot of committees. He's done a lot of work. Um, Michelle's the same way. My contributions to science, I've, I have authored a couple of papers, but they were with a whole lot of doctors that did most of the authoring. So um, my name's on them. I claim them. I reviewed them. But uh, some of us are going to have more contributions to science than others. And the last thing is they're going to want to know what kind of research support you've done. Um, have you already been a, a, a patient advocate on a research proposal? Have you reviewed one that was uh, applying for funds? You need to put all of that in. And then the last thing is they're actually going to ask you if you've ever been funded. So Susan will probably talk about this a little bit. That's where 
um, the KU researchers are going to list are going to list all of the things that they've actually um, had funded that will be important. People will go back and they'll look at what has been funded. If the things that have been funded previously apply to what they're actually applying for right now. So your bio sketch is really a moving, uh, a moving living document that you're going to be looking at each time you're uh, requested to submit one, you're going to look at it and which one am I going to use or how can I change it um, to strengthen my, my bio sketch. Next, next slide. So this is just a this is just a blank bio sketch right here. It's what it looks like when you pull it up. It even says that it's a sample across the top if you try to print it out. Um, but it just tells you kind of what in detail to put in each of those little slots. And this is exactly what mine looks like. And we're going to get to that on the next slide, please. So she's going to click on my bio sketch. I think should come right up. Let's hope so. Let's see. It came up in mine. And, um, yeah. Hi, Peggy. You just became enlarged in my screen. <laughs> you too. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so Michelle, you just kind of let me know when you want me to scroll down. Okay, very good. Well, um, we're just going to start at the top. You can see my name is there. I use my middle initials. Um, for my position title, I put that as a patient advocate because that is what this particular one is being used for. And my education and training is to what Peggy said before. As you can see, I have an associate degree in nursing that I earned in 1983. And I don't have, you know, some doctorate degree sitting out here. This is just my basic background training um, as a registered nurse. So below that is my personal statement. And I start out, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. I'm pretty sure nobody wants me to read the whole thing. But I start out saying who I am. I say who, what my name is and, and sort of who I am as a person and what I do as a job right now. And then I immediately plow into my story and that I was diagnosed with stage four anal cancer and kind of give a very cliff note version of my battle with cancer over the last nine years. That's a booty. You can scroll just a little so we can get to the bottom of it because that's okay. real kind of where I change things. I no cancer. So I put that I, what I've done, I've written some articles, what's, what, I, what I like to do, what, how I like to advocate. But then I also put how I've evolved as, a, as an advocate. So I've turned my attention to research advocacy where at first I was doing more awareness raising of my kind of rare cancer. I became really interested in research advocacy. I became very interested in what was going on at the laws that were being made over palliative care. Then I wanted to, I, this one particular one went to the rectal anal task force that I sit on at the oh. NIH. Oh. And I put that I was very passionate about the patient survival experience and particularly long-term side effect minimization with the developing of new therapies. And that really helped, I think, really seal the deal for me to get on this committee because I have stage four cancer and I already know that what I'm, when I get involved with research, I'm probably not going to change anything for myself. It's too late for me. I already got stage four cancer. But if I want to work in prevention or if I want to work in developing, helping to develop new therapies, they really need to hear from the patient that has the long-term side effect that, hey, these are some things that maybe need to be changed. We need to alter things so that people can survive better. So that's, that's my synopsis of my personal statement that I put in for, to sit on the rectal anal task force as a patient advocate. So going to positions and honors, 
Um, I you always start with your most recent thing that goes at the top. And um, my, the most recent thing for me is the National Institute of Health, the Rectal Anal Task Force that I just started on this year. And I actually um, have gotten to see some really exciting things. It's probably the deepest I've ever dug into research. So it's been kind of fun for me. Um, the different steering committees I sit on locally and nationally. Um, and right up to the very first thing that I did, which was I sat on an HPV spore committee through MD Anderson. Um, that was probably one of the most, that's really what changed what I was doing was, you know, my doctor at, in Houston said, hey, we've got this HPV spore committee that's meeting on our site. Do you want to be part of that? And I got to be, that was one of the first things I did. My contributions to science, I only have three things um, for as long as I've been doing this, but I've been published a couple of times, um, did some, talked with some researchers, been published with my doctor that took care of me in Houston a couple of times. The very first article I wrote was in 2015. I, I've written articles in the cardiology side before as a nurse, but I'd never been involved in anything like this. And Dr. Ng asked me if I would, if I would mind collaborating. So it was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. But from there, Next thing I knew, I was talking to Cure Magazine with Dr. Ng, and then I was on the, published in the Surgical Oncology Clinicals in North America. I actually wrote the first chapter of that, of that thing. That's process all in itself. So those are my contributions to science. Um, here's what I put under my additional information and support in scholastic performance. One is what we're doing right now is my involvement with the Midwest Cancer Alliance pivot and the, being on the development team for that and my involvement there. My oncology nursing news contributions, I've written several articles for them and I've just listed them here with the dates. Um, I am a published author. I wrote a book. It's th the third edition actually just came out in April. Um, if you're not laughing, you're dying. It's the third edition. Um, for that book. And then for me, this is something that I added to my own bio sketch, but was interestingly discussed at the Rectal Anal Task Force when they welcomed me, was my social media platforms. And um, my blog, which should not be underlined in blue and highlighted, please forgive me. <laughs> but I should just have that I the name of my blog without the dot com on there. Um, my Twitter, uh, my Instagram, and um, my 52 Shades of Blue Facebook page, all of those things are things that I do for advocacy. So there was a, actually quite a bit of interest from the Rectal Anal Task Force in that because they knew I kind of had this, it's not really an underground railroad, it's like a public where a lot of people with my rare cancer reach out to me. So I have a lot of resources of people with anal cancer. And there may be people on this call that I'm the only person that they know that has ever had it because it's that rare, but they know how important it is. If they're looking for real life patient data, they want feedback from a lot of different resources. So those have actually been, um, they were actually one of my strengths on this particular, on this particular position at the, on the NIH with the Rectal Anal Task Force. And I think that's the end of mine. Yeah. For, this, for this particular one, that is the end of mine. So it's not, it's kind of like your resume for your, your resume for what you're doing out there in the big wide world. So now I think Wendy is going to show hers. Uh, brought up here. Hold on just a second, Wendy. So while um, she's bringing that up, I'll give you a little bit of background in that um, I'm new to patient advocacy um, and also, um, well, I guess I'm not new to Pivot. It's been over a year, but two years ago, I didn't even know what a patient advocate was. <laughs> and um, so I actually uh, got surprised with the biosketch. Um, in that um, I was asked to provide one and um, I really didn't know what they were. <laughs> um, so what I ended up doing is I tried to kind of figure out how to put one together 
And um, I had a, a researcher who had approached me and they knew that I was doing a lot of advocacy, awareness and education for a rare disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a connective tissue disease and it impacts every part of your body. And so she wanted to go ahead and submit a grant to be able to study what other different illnesses come with Ehlers-Danlos. For instance, how does it impact your GI or your brain or your blood vessels or whatever. And there is an opportunity to go out and look at patients who have a diagnosis um, for EDS to try to understand or connect the dots of what other things doctors should look for. So she reached out to me and she said, well, you are an expert in your particular disease. So I would like to ask you to be a consultant on this project from a patient advocate perspective. And I thought that's really great. We brainstormed a whole lot of things and we came up with uh, what we were gonna ask for um, in a grant. And the first one that we did, we didn't require a biosketch, but then we were going to go after an NIH grant. And um, the researcher came back to me and said, you need to do this biosketch. And that was about all I got. <laughs> instruction how to do one. So um, I had luckily uh, remembered um, when I thought about it that, that when I was reading through articles for Pivot, I had seen something on a biosketch. And so first I looked at the directions um, that we looked at on the NIH site. And since I'm not a researcher, I was a little intimidated and I didn't quite even understand what the categories meant. So it wasn't enough information for me to really even know what to include. So luckily I went over to the, um, the Komen site and because I had seen some of the things that they did and they had some great examples, they had a new advocate. Um, so basically an example there. And then they also had an experienced one. So I printed them off both of them. And I tried to kind of model mine after those. Um, and again, initially very intimidated because I'm not a researcher, right? So what do you put on this? So I went ahead and drafted something. And then afterwards, I went back to, to Peggy and Michelle after the fact. And I said, you know, I wonder how I did. Um, because I hadn't really gotten any guidance or any support and Peggy gave me some great feedback. Now I haven't revised this, so this is the older version. Um, so we can go through that and I can talk about some of the things that I learned after the fact. Now, subsequently, um, within six months, I've had to use this now three or four times, actually four times. Um, so there's been a lot of other venues that I've used this for. Uh, to be on a panel, a speaker panel. Um, I'm going to be a speaker at a conference. Um, and so in addition to research, I'm also using this for other things. Uh, so it's been very helpful. Um, so in this case, uh, a patient research advocate, when it talked about education, I went back to my nursing degree um, and I see that I'm older than Michelle. And uh, <laughs> so I went back to my BSN and, but really the last 25 plus years, I was an executive at Sprint. I only was a BSN, a nursing on the floor for four years. And then I helped install hospital computer systems for four years. But then after that, um, you know, I've been doing other things. So if you go down to the personal statement. Okay, so here on the personal statement, I really did think that maybe you should bring in your qualifications, um, reason why they'd wanna look at you. So initially I was thinking, well, I can pull together a lot of different things in that I'm a patient, so I have my own experience. I am a BSN, and so nursing experience, 
And also, I've done a lot of things around executive medical expertise. So I have a lot of background in starting things up um, and successes. So uh, I talked about that. I also talked about how, um, you know, the training that I've done to position me for this, to be an expert. I did a lot of travel to different seminars and different education conferences to learn about EDS and how to connect with doctors and that kind of thing. But subsequently, the feedback that Peggy had given me is I do have a good personal story and I didn't realize that putting that in was significant. So for me, um, the reason why this is so important to me is that my type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, at least in my family, people die of cerebral aneurysms. And so my dad died of an aneurysm at 55, his mom at 54, uh, her sisters, um, and we had the same kind of Ehlers-Danlos. And for me, the reason why um, I'm doing this and I'm trying to put a whole lot of energy into it is that I just, you know, I turned 60 this year and I really am trying to do as much as I can to support EDS while I can. Um, so that's why I'm fo focusing on a, a lot of uh, more the shorter term awareness and education and some of the other things too. And then um, helping connect the dots on comorbidities and illnesses that come with it. So this, uh, if I if I did go ahead and apply for uh, another NIH with a researcher, I would probably be fed up. Um, so that that was that first part, and then I keep keep going up there. So and this is really interesting. So positions and employment I took pretty literally just because. That's how I saw in the examples. But what I learned um, when Michelle just went through hers, like for instance, I started a 501c3 organization called EDSKC Collaboration Inc. Um, and I'm the president and, found, and founder of that. And I, I didn't think that that's something I would put here. Um, I was thinking more like job position and employment, but I'm wondering now, and, and, and Peggy and Michelle, and you can weigh in here, would that be something that I would have put here? Okay, I'm seeing the nods. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I was taking, because I was only looking at the examples, the two examples that I had, I was taking it very concretely. Um, so this is helping me understand that under here you can put other things, like if you're over a president over charity. And there's a lot of affiliations that I'm, um, I'm associated with. And so maybe I should have put some of that in there. I don't know. Okay, so then career accomplishments. Um, there's a lot of stuff I did in my career, but there's not a whole lot of things that I did in research. So I put a lot of things, and then you can go through all this, it talks about all the startup and re-engineering and budgets, and I had organizations up to a, a thousand people, and I um, you know, grew a business to 4.5 million customers, and all this is great, but one of the things that Peggy pointed out to me is, maybe this won't be, isn't as applicable as some of the things that I'm doing now um, and some of my advocacy stuff, or maybe go back to some of the things that I used to do in nursing. Um, so those are some of the things, you know, some of the feedback I got, if you keep scrolling. So here's some more, I put in a little bit of nursing and went and automated hospital systems, but um, maybe elaborating more on that. So now here's where I went ahead and put down um, my memberships and affiliations. So I'm an affiliate member of the Elder Stanlow Society, ambassador for Rare KC, a foundation alliance member, um, and part of Pivot. So I felt a little better that I could put some things in there. <laughs> 
So then what I ended up focusing most of this was on my training and education. Because after I got diagnosed, one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to teach local doctors how to support, how to treat EDS patients. And I wanted them to do it from a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, so I knew that one of my goals was to do a seminar in Kansas City to bring in national experts and local physicians to be able to kind of mentor, teach, present together, and have it be a good um, collaborative experience, patients, researchers, and physicians. So I spent tons of time studying, learning, training, um, and this is missing, and, and back to what um, Michelle and Peggy had said earlier, is I have a whole bunch of 2019 things in here too. Um, so what I need to do is keep this ever fresh. And so I went and there's an added, I had to turn, I had to turn one of these in on the weekend. In that now that I'm a speaker at a national seminar, they wanted um, like a CV or a bio sketch. So I went ahead and put in all the 2019 things. Um, but you see here, this was a version from two weeks ago. Um, or, or a month ago. So keeping it ever fresh is a good, good thing, especially if you turn, have to turn something around really quickly. Um, so then uh, the contributions to advocacy or science, I stretched a little bit to talk more about the advocacy. So here's where I talk about all the collaborative things that I'm doing to try to get some of our local hospitals Children's Mercy, KU, to actually have a strategic plan for supporting a rare disease and supporting Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So um, there's a lot of things, all this kind of kind of highlights, so you can keep going, going through this. Just kind of skip through it. I don't want people to have to read all this, but it talks about all the things I'm doing. And I also put in, and maybe you guys can, can kind of give feedback here, in that I'm involved in a lot of research projects in that um, I'm enrolled. So one of the things for the, the type of um, genetic EDS that I have, there are 14 kinds, and the, but the one that's most common doesn't have a genetic marker identified yet. So I am enrolled in various studies to help um, hopefully advance science by finding those markers and my family, because I got diagnosed also, they got evaluated and we got some family members. So I put this on as a research contributor. Um, and I don't know, I'll throw it out to you. Is that something that you can include in something like this? Okay, so Peggy's, Peggy's nodding, okay. <laughs> and then here's, here's all the stuff that I've done for cancer. And um, so this is my pivot uh, background and um, all the different things that I'm doing there. And I wasn't sure, um, for instance, Pivot has had some major deliverables. Can I go ahead and say that I was part of the team toward that? I, I went ahead and put it in there because I thought, well, maybe I can claim that if it's a sort of a team approach from Pivot since I'm part of Pivot. Um, so I went ahead and, um, you know, provided anything that I was a, a team, you know, contributor toward. And so then we can maybe flip through this. Um, and I wasn't exactly sure what they were looking for, for like research support or scholastic performance. Um, so again, I took that very literally, and I just talked about that I graduated summa cum laude because I wasn't exactly sure what to even put in here. <laughs> and by then, I was up to four pages anyway, which I think was the limit. <laughs> four pages is the limit. Yeah, <laughs> they just cut you off. Yeah. So I think what I would do, you know, as I evolve, um, I would probably tailor down or cut out some of all the education stuff 
and then start beefing up, you know, the different contributions that I've actually done for research. So that's mine. So I think one of the things that we need to make sure that people understand is um, Michelle and Wendy both really have Hello. a lot to put on. Hello. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are we okay? Um, I, I think they both, their, their bio sketches are very developed. Not everybody's going to have one that's that developed, and it's okay because um, we need new patient advocates all the time. So it's okay that you don't have all the training, all of the webinars, and all of the experience. You're going to use your experience either as a co survivor or a survivor uh, or a researcher that, that you're going to develop your bio sketch. So it, they, but these are both, they both have wonderful bio sketches and, and Wendy's is very developed for a new advocate because she's got a, a lot of background. So I don't want to scare anybody off thinking that they have to have all this stuff because when I started, there wasn't much on mine. Um, and it's just good, it's just good to get started. Okay. Yep, Susan's up. So I'll take it from here. Um, Great. What I can say to you all, I, when I look at a bio sketch, I'm looking at it from the review perspective of what the, um, how it fits in with the grant as a whole, and how what the reviewer is looking for, and then also what the researcher is looking for. So if you're looking at being an advocate, if this is something that really interests you, especially if you're wishing to um, participate in a research uh, grant or a research proposal. Um, you know, get to know your PI, get to know your investigator, talk to him about what, uh, what kind of work are they doing. You know, they obviously approached you if they felt like you were someone that would speak, you know, to the cancer that they're addressing. They came to you for a reason. Your voice counts. You know, they felt that your story, your circumstances, and your um, commitment was impressive enough that they want to talk about you and their grant. You know, so exactly what Peggy and Michelle were saying, a lot of our patient advocate bio sketches are a page or two pages long. And what I would say to you is that you don't have to go um, to every, uh, to, to legislatures or to, you know, to the state of Kansas or all of these things. Talk to your church group. You know, talk to, you know, my, my husband is a runner and he has a running group that he meets with every week. If you have any social activities that you are presenting your story and you're advocating for cancer research or you're advocating for fundraising or you're advocating for policy changes, all of that starts at a grassroots level. You know, talk to your people in your neighborhood, that sort of thing. And every time you do that, write it down, write the date down. Right where where you where you presented, I presented at this date at this church to this group of people. That's how you start building up your bio sketch. It's everyday interactions with people that you care about or people that are important to you. That's where it starts, you know. And so, and as far as the personal statement is concerned, that is probably the most flexible part of your bio sketch, meaning that you dependent upon who you're working with, like if you work with a different investigator, different emphasis, you might change it up a little bit, you know. So what I usually tell my researchers, and they know this, is that you, you have your, what I call your master bio sketch, and that's where you list literally everything that you've ever done ever. And that could be however many pages long. But then when you get to a specific project, or a specific thing that you are working with, well, that's when you start cutting things out or amending it a little bit. You see, and, and you get it so that it's it's more specifically focused toward whatever it is that you're applying for or that you're doing. So I always keep a master, you know, and then you just amend it and tweak it as you need to. Um, some of the things that I've listed up here on this slide are just very technical. And they're, but they're important. So 
the biosketch form hasn't changed much, but it does change. And so you always want to make sure that you've got the most recent version. And that's what's listed there, you know, at that, that site. Um, appropriate font and spacing tech, usually for research proposals, it's, it's Arial 11. Now that doesn't mean that you can't do something different if you're just, if it's a personal bio sketch that you want to give to someone. But overall, that's the font you use. Half inch margins all around. But the thing about it is that you want to keep your bio sketch uniform with the project. So whatever the researcher is, how he is choosing to list things, you want to kind of keep it and it's looking similarly. Usually someone from the research team can help you. That's a lot of my job that I do for the cancer researchers is that I help them to put their best foot forward. And so all of the bio sketches that I review and everything that I, that I um, am looking at, I'm looking at how can we put our best foot forward. So I would look at your bio sketch the same way I would look at any of my researchers, you know. And so a lot of these little technical things of, you know, keeping it uniform, making sure your personal statement reflects the project. So if there, if, if Dr. Welch, I know you've worked with him, is talking about, you know, breast cancer, and you're a breast cancer survivor, well then being specific to that. Some of you may have experiences. Um, I think Peggy had said that she was an advocate before she was a survivor, right? So she had an interest in being an advocate. And, and that's, that is a pathway. But when she's given the opportunity to specifically talk to, about her breast cancer experience, and she's working with a researcher that's dealing in breast cancer, well, then you bring that up in your personal statement. That's more of the emphasis. If she was talking to a legislator, a legislative person, then she might talk about her history as a patient advocate across a lot of different areas of cancer. Do you see? So um, correct grammar and spelling, I mean, that's something we all just need to be aware of. But reviewers notice that. They notice that things are misspelled. It's a silly, tiny little thing, but just go back and have a second set of eyes, go back and look at it. Um, chronological order of positions and honors. For personal bio sketches, what they've suggested where you put the newest thing first, that's perfectly fine. In a research grant, it's actually the opposite. You put the oldest things first, and then it goes to the new. Um, and so again, you're following the format of the research project. So. Either one of those can work. It just depends upon the circumstances, okay? You guys will probably not need to deal with PMC ID numbers, but if you have a publication that would have been in a prominent journal, so if you are on a team, if you end up doing this and you end up being listed as part of a, a, part of a team that was on a publication, there's now a thing called PMC ID numbers that is identifying in PubMed that, that actual publication. And this is a requirement from the NIH. So it's one of those things that, again, if you were to submit your proposal to me, I probably would do that work for you. But if you don't have me, <laughs> not everybody gets to have me. <laughs> so, but if you don't have me, that just would be something to keep in mind. We're going to go on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so things that you don't want, that you want to avoid. Uh, don't use tables in, in a bio sketch. I know that it's really neat and it looks cool for you, but from someone reviewing it, it, it just annoys them. <laughs> so, so please don't do that. Uh, you don't use footers or headers unless you're using uh, specific forms. There, um, the bio sketch form that you were given, um, there's two different types of research proposals. There's one that is a paper copy and they will already have headers and footers in them. And then there is a version of a research grant that is, is electronic. The electronic one will have no headers or footers. This is getting terribly technical. Don't worry about it. Someone will call you on it, okay? But just so you know that you don't add page numbers, you don't add anything to your bio sketch, because people normally want to put page numbers and that sort of thing, and leave that alone. Uh, the active links also, you could list a link. I mean, that's okay. It just can't be active. It can't be clickable. You can't click on it and it's gonna go somewhere. Uh, from a research perspective, the reason why they don't allow that is they look at that as cheating. You're putting in additional information 
that would not have normally been allowed in a grant. You're adding to the pages of a grant inadvertently by adding a link, you know. So those are just little things to avoid, and they're very technical, but it's what makes it's what makes your bioskit shine and what makes it sparkle a little bit. Um, and I just want to make sure. And then the, the page limit has gone up to five, so it is now five pages as opposed to four. So that gives you an extra page to talk about your set. <laughs> so, um, but what I really want to emphasize, though, you know, I uh, I was the community chair or the committee chair for my my son's Boy Scout troop for four years. That's a volunteer. That's a volunteer opportunity. And because I work at the cancer center, there were times that I would go and talk to them about cancer screenings in particular. So. When I say, you know, start where you are, do that. If there's places within your community that you can make a difference and that you can speak to your experience and point people to resources that they didn't know were available, that's advocacy. That's advocacy at a very personal level. You know, that's making a difference in the lives of the people that are closest to you. Your voice is your most authentic weapon in doing what you need to do. Your voice is important. And just know that every time that you have an opportunity to make a bio sketch and present your personal statement, present your personal story, that is an opportunity to be an advocate. So, um, so yeah, anytime you're invited to be on a panel, you're invited to be on a committee, create your own opportunities, I guess is what I'm saying to you. You know, you're not always not, there's a lot of people, and this is a beautiful growing group of people across the state of Kansas. It's growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Sarah was talking to me a little bit about that beforehand. You know, create your own opportunities to speak to your experience. And I think that that is really where you have the most authentic way of, of meeting something that you're passionate about and that is important to you. So that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> so. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to open it up to questions. Let's see what time we are. Right at 6, so if you guys do have to go, no worries. But um, we're going to hang on here for about 10 minutes just to kind of answer everybody's questions. So well, let me. 10 minutes will be enough time. <laughs> Probably not. So <laughs> we'll have to see kind of, you know, and Peggy and Michelle and Wendy, are you guys available if we kind of run over a little bit? Okay. Sure. Okay. So, all right, but if anybody has to go, no worries. Um, I totally understand. So let me get everybody's faces on the screen so we can see here. So Sarah, while you're doing that, I want to thank Susan because I've had a bio sketch for, like I said, I think 10 years. I'm going back and look at mine again because you gave us, you pointed out some really good things that I think each of us could go back and look at again. So I, I want to thank you for your insight. You did a good job of uh, helping us helping us see through this. So thanks a lot. Well, thank, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. So, yes. so I, I think we're going to start with the Zoom world. Um, I'm just going to kind of call your name. And if you have a question, say, say your question. If you don't, just say pass. Um, so let's start with Julie. Do you have any questions? No questions. All right. How about Karen? Do you have a question? No. No. OK. <laughs> awesome. Joy, do you have any questions? Um, the one thing I would say, and I thank you so much, Tilly, for, for, for your work as well. Um, I've been in a position where, um, for grants, I've had to construct biosketches for uh, researchers, academic, academicians. Um, being, and w when you submit grants, the number of pages is really important. So um, if you can help <laughs> your researcher, I can't tell you the number of times I've I'm so proud of people who have all these accomplishments that take up four or five pages. But when I have to get it down to one page, <laughs> um, it can be a challenge. So um, I think being as clear as possible, but as concise as possible. Um, if, if it's a grant submission, if it's not, then yay, all the pages you want. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. So are, are you saying um, that it's better, even if you're doing an NIH or something like that, to keep it as short as possible? No, I wouldn't say that. You need to, you need to speak to your experience. Um, 
but you don't, don't feel like you have to fill up all five pages. Don't feel like you have to. You know, the thing about it, they're, they're going to look at your personal statement and they're going to look at your um, activities probably the most, you know, because most of you probably aren't going to have publications or research support or what have you. So that's really the first two pages, right? That's where most of that information is going to be. And then if there's something really specific that they think, well, okay, let me keep reading, then they'll keep reading. But you want to capture your most important information really on those first couple of pages. You know, and that's not to say if you have a if you've got a bazillion things to talk about, well then fill up your five pages and there you go. <laughs> Great. Okay, how about Daniela? Do you have any questions? I think she's muted. So um, how about Ashley? Do you have any questions? You still on here? Yep, I'm here. Um, I'm okay. in a path. Okay, perfect. And then I think we have um, Sharon. Do you have any questions? Okay. Her back. Um, all right, let's open it up to the room. Oh, wait, wait. I don't know if I got Becky. Becky, you probably have. Do you have any questions? Uh, I think I'm on. Okay. Um, yeah. I and one question. Um, so like the rapid reactor things that we've been doing, would that count as like um, experiences? I think so. Would it, Peggy, do you? Absolutely. Um, because you're working with a researcher mm -hmm. and you're giving advice to the researcher, I absolutely would have to, would advise you to put them in there but you're going to have to explain to them what rapid reactor is right <laughs> so it, it, okay. they might they might think you were into dinosaurs or something so, um, <laughs> if you would probably have to give a line or two explanation of what rap, rapid reactor is but mm -hmm. absolutely every one of those that you do with the researcher i would put in there because that's really great experience and they'll understand that you understand the the research process of helping a researcher from the patient's voice. So, no, I, that's great. It's a good idea. Okay. And then if when we write one um, and we have a draft, is there anyone we can, any volunteers we can send it to to look over it? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Michelle and uh, Peggy, are you willing to kind of, if they, if you guys send them to me, can I pass them on to you and uh, Michelle? Sure. Sure. And, sure. And I think, and, and Wendy too, because Wendy's going to look okay. at him as a new person too. So no, I yeah. no, I think that's part of the reason why we did this is so um, we want to help people get them done. I would be interested in how many people that are on the line or in the room actually already have their NIH bio. Do do any of you? Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. that you should ask that. So I'm literally right now been asked to submit one because of. Uh, my organization has been considered as a sub-award recipient, and so I've been asked to put a bio sketch together, and my challenge is now trying to remember all that stuff that you said I've done, <laughs> and then trying to make it concise and in the order it should go. So one of the things, and I can talk offline, but I've got at least seven things that I want to ask, because again, I literally have, and what's interesting is that uh, I was asked to submit something this past Friday, and I was working with a researcher who gave, who provided a much different focus or review than what's being, that I'm learning today. Mm -hmm. And so I would submit that there may be researchers who don't fully understand, engage, or aware of what a patient advocate's That's bio yes. would look like versus a researcher's bio sketch. So she gave me her bio sketch. And I tried to follow it, and it just didn't yeah. fit. Uh, no, so, it wouldn't. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> although I do have some things, and so she was kind of concerned about some of the things that I've done in community, not understanding how it connected with advocacy. Right. And so, again, I'm, I'm happy. I've, I've got a couple. I should have brought my laptop, but I've got a couple examples I'd love for someone to take a look at. But even with what's being shared tonight, I'm already wanting to add things. So, mm -hmm. so 
I don't know if it's my turn or not. Yeah, yeah, go for it. You got the floor. Um, so, so that's part of my challenge is one, uh, as a look at position. So I've worked in quite a few places. How important is it to, for me to list every place that I worked versus the last three years or something like that? How important is it for me to be as detailed with what I did at some of those places? Mm -hmm. um, for example, I worked in two instances. I worked as a CRA where QA clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Then I also worked at one of those like, uh, uh, what is it now? Quintiles. Mm -hmm. So actually work. So those are both research related, but that's back in the early 80s. So it's not something that's that's, okay. that is as relevant as today. Uh, and then I also had the question of who can review, and I would welcome someone actually walking, I volunteer, one of us through, okay, here's what I got, what fits, what makes sense, when to cut out this, when to cut out that, to literally go through actually one of us going through a biosketch live. Okay. Yeah. So we can it, definitely implement so, that. So one of the things that I said with Wendy was because hers was very very extensive because she really has some wonderful work experience um and that may not be where you want to spend your your lines your space okay. and right. um i recommended to her that she pick out the things that she's most proud of the things mm -hmm. that that the things that moved her career regardless of where it was that moved her career forward now susan may have a, a different take on that but I think I put down the things I, I could, I don't have my whole work history in there. I put down the things that were important to me that I learned on the job that I, that, you know, I felt like I, I grew through that job and the things that I was proud of. So, and Broderick, you may be proud of all of them and you should put them all down. You just may not have to put them in, in deep detail. Well, and I was concerned because I was getting, trying to remember, okay, when did I work there and how long was that? So I was concerned <laughs> with, you know, making sure that I had the right month and yeah. year and, to, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I, I, I had the resume mindset trying to mm -hmm. fit it into a bio sketch and I was being encouraged not to do that. But again, not knowing what they're looking at or what they're, you know, how. So if I chose to, for example, use my work at when I was at uh, Burger Boy or Quintiles, then skip to work that I'm doing now. Is that a issue that I have a gap in work history, for example? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that they, the reviewers are looking at this a little differently than they're looking at the researcher. The researcher has to put every single thing in there. Okay. They really do because they, they want to see a, a sense of continuity okay. in the research career growing. But I don't know that it's that it's as important for you guys to do that. I kind of agree with Peggy from the perspective of, you know, put the, the important things, the relevant things, you know, if there's a huge gap of this, you could even put a little simple line, you know, worked in a variety of X, Y, or Z, okay. you know, during this time frame. You know. So it's, it's not important then to show how you progress in a career if it's outside of like research or medical? Well, I wouldn't say that either because your life experience is important. You know, what it, it did bring you to where you are right now. You know, yeah. so I wouldn't necessarily say if it's, if it's not research or medical that it shouldn't be listed. Of course it should, that's your life. You know, that's, that's where, that's what has created you and made you the person that you are. So I don't see that you need to look at it that way. If it was, a, it's like what Peggy was saying, if this was some, an important part of your life, an important part of your career, if it's made you who you are, well then list it, you know? Okay. It's, that, that's really. But it's not because, like a resume where like an employer would look up and say, kind of to Roderick's point. No, you didn't work here. You <laughs> didn't put this and you didn't put no. this. In. Okay. No. <laughs> Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, that was my biggest friend. And then the other thing that I'll have, and again, we can do this later, is what, where do certain things like, for example, if, if, if we participated on a research community action board, does that go under honors or positions? Sure. Or does that go under contribution to science? You could put it under contributions. I also think that honor, you know, if it honors if you were chosen to be a speaker or chosen to do something, well, that's an honor, isn't okay. it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, you know, well, you seriously, like well, really, yeah. that, that's the, they thought enough of you that they asked you to do something. So that could be seen as an honor, or if you are part of a group or something that, you know, from that group initial, initial discussions and other things evolved, that could be a contribution to science. So, for example, so, I participated on several PCORI grants, for example. Oh, that's awesome. That's so great. That falls under... That would be under contributions kind of, to science. Okay. Yeah. No, if you ever actually work on a, on a research project in some respect, then that would either be contributions to science or research support. So okay. either one of those, okay. you know. Yeah, if you were actually a listed key member on a grant, then that would go into research support. Okay. So, anything else? Any questions? Oh, mine, mine is sort of the opposite of, of all of this. It's, I mean, I have a 30-year work history in a particular field that's completely unrelated to this. It's employment services and helping people get jobs in the nonprofit world. Sure. But, um, and I've re been retired for almost six years. I've been doing a lot of volunteer work, mostly with Susan G. Komen here mm -hmm. in Kansas City and one other um, organization that I'm not really working with so, so much right now, but, um, my my concern is being able to fill up a page, <laughs> let alone cutting back a page, you know. Mm -hmm. And my contributions to science, you know, may, worked it, at a health fair, represented Susan G. Komen that's fine. at a health fair, you know. Right, but, but and I mean, with people there, but if if there's an area, because there's like four major areas, if there's an area that you really don't have anything, well, that's fine. Just let it let it be. Just, just li list the, list the header. They will ask that the header be there. Yeah, but li yeah, list the header. But, or... Yeah, just not, just put an NA or okay. none at this time or whatever. Okay. You yeah, know. I don't have any of mine on my any of my work history of as a cardiac rhythm nurse. It, it doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing now. I'm still employed. I, I'm still working a 50 hour work week. I mean, I I don't have that on me because that's what they weren't looking for, and it didn't. It wasn't moving forward what I wanted my bio. Now, if I was going to do some cardiac research, uh, that would be a whole different looking bio sketch than the one I have now. And I put all the things that I did to advance cardiac care for heart rhythm. Just, so I don't, I don't think it's a negative at all that, I mean, if you don't, if, but if you are looking to put something down, I've taken things off and put things in. So I, I wouldn't think that that's a negative at all to me. Yeah. But that's what I was saying to keep the master the master bio sketch. Right. And so the master bio sketch is the one, one that you list anything and everything that you can possibly think of. It's 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 like everything. And then when you get asked for specific things that come up, well then you can kind of maybe pick and choose. Right. You know. Well, this is re I think that this is relevant. You know. But uh, but yeah, just you would be surprised because. I guarantee you that each one of you has done more than what you think you have. I guarantee you. Well, so, and this is sort of like... I guarantee you that there's more opportunities for you to do something than what you think there are. Because yeah. it's like, well, how can I make a difference? Well, you're here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're here. You're at this training. You're yeah. present at this training, mm -hmm. which means that you cared enough to show up to be here and that you want to be an advocate. Write that down. That, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you now have a training under your belt that you didn't have an hour ago. Right. So. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Couple.